Welcome everyone to the Jimmy Think Tank, our weekly forum where we discuss with the Global Management Institute um, ambassadors and CTPs and experts in innovation topics around trends that are affecting or impacting innovation, the state of innovation in countries around the world, and the Jimmy intellectual property and progress to democratize innovation. Today, we have a really special guest, Dr. Guillermo de Aro. Um, he's an engineer, an MA, an MBA, a doctor. He's more than prepared in, in education. And he's the interim vice dean of the EA School of Science and Technology and the academic director for this school as well, where he manages the master in big data and business analytics and the master in computer science and business technology. He will obviously introduce himself, but we're very excited to have him here. Guillermo, welcome to the Jimmy Think Tank. You will have 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, to do your presentation. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session uh, in which the audience can interact with you. So welcome, Guillermo, and everyone be sure to write questions in the chat and be prepared for the discussion. Thank you very much, Larissa. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I will try to to be uh, focused on on the on the points I want to make in the in the time that I have. And well, my proposal for today was to talk about my book. I came here to talk about my book. Um, I, I wrote several books, in fact, but uh, lately uh, I have discovered that uh, there is a great link between the ancient Greeks and the ancient philosophy and what we're doing every day in our lives. And this is linked to a couple of disciplines that I am working right now. <clears throat> First of all, which are the big questions in life? Why we're here? What is our, our reason to be here? What do we want to do in life? How do you live a good life? Um, let's begin with the first one. Uh, as I said, I like writing books. Uh, I, I made the first one when I was doing my MBA. I'm a telco engineer, but uh, I, I studied uh, an MBA at IBS school in the year 2002. And there I discovered case studies. I wrote several case studies. And then my first book was Collier in a Business School. It's about how to learn management, watching movies of The Godfather, uh, which, by the way, I think is mandatory to attend this session. Yeah, You all have watched The Godfather? No? Yeah? OK, you can answer <laughs> later. Um, well, after that, uh, I, I wrote some other books. And the last one is about philosophy. It's a small book on the Stoic philosophy. And the reason why we wrote this book is basically because we're writing a book about complexity. We're writing a book about complex problem solving. And we wanted to do a, a part on biases for decision making. And, and we talked to my to my publisher and the publisher said the idea is very good, but I don't think there is a market. But there is a huge market in the stoicism and I don't have uh, anybody to write about this. And I thought, OK, but I am, I am an engineer with an MBA. I have no idea about the stoicism. I don't work with philosophy. Um, the point is that preparing the proposal and working on the book, I discovered that I knew a lot and that I have been teaching philosophy for 20 years without knowing it. So when we take a look at this book and the big questions in life, we enter into the, the discussion of, okay, why I'm here, we know, but why we're here. And yeah, if, if, you, if you look at these videos, did you know videos that, that were famous some years ago? Uh, I think they were in the year 2010. There are, there are five minutes videos with, with a lot of information that gives you a context of what is going on in, in, the, in the competitive environment. And then we discovered that the, the world is changing very fast lately, uh, mostly if you have invested in the Silicon Valley Bank. And, uh, and to make decisions in this environment, it's complicated. So all the traditional tools, the traditional strategy, everything that we know is still applicable. How can we apply it? And we discovered also that the traditional strategy was focused to solve problems in some specific context, but we have this, this complex, volatile, ambiguous, and uncertain environments, and they probably have heard this word several times, that uh, makes us solve problems that we have never faced before. That's a complex problem, a problem that we have never seen before. And Complex problem solving is one of the tools that uh, is considered most important for the, for the near future. We know how to solve problems. We have a lot of tools about that. We know how to develop a strategy. We know about operations. There are, there are a lot of things that we have been doing for many years and that we are teaching. But how do you solve problems that never before are solved? And, and well, that's also part of my job as a teacher and as academic director. I teach my students how to solve problems. So my job 
to, to teach them how to solve problems is to create problems. Huh? So my job is to create problems to them. So I, I, I love my job, as I said, as academic director. And, uh, but how do we create complex problems uh, co uh, problems to, to solve, to, to teach the people how to solve them? How do we deal with this, with this uh, new environment, new science? And then we discovered that this has something in common everywhere, which are basically the human factor, the people and the people decision making. And, and people are basically one of the main sources of, of complex problems. We know about pandemics. We have had pandemics before. We have a lot of literature about what happened in the, in the 1960s with the Spanish flu, the so badly called the Spanish flu, by the way. But we have another pandemic and again, we make same mistakes. Again, the decisions of many people turned out into a problem that we have never faced before in this way, closing a globalized and interconnected world. So how to survive in this new world? At the end of the day, what we're doing is making decisions, uh, making decisions to solve problems, to achieve our target. So the goal of philosophy is to help us, to help us make better decisions. And particularly, the stoicism is a philosophy based on the scientific method, which is something that we teach in universities and we teach in, in business schools. I mean, how to make decisions with, with a tool, with, uh, with a framework, with a background behind that helps you learn when you make mistakes. And particularly, the idea of stoicism is how to, how to live a good life, how to make decisions to live a good life. Well, this is not easy, okay? Epictetus, who was also a slave, said the struggle is great, the task divine, gain mastery, freedom, happiness, and, and tranquility during the process. How do we do that? Well, first of all, in taking decisions, we remember the classic Henry Mitchell. Uh, I think he's still alive. I mean, he must be something like 90 years old. Uh, he, he was from Canada. So the, 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 the basics of a strategy were, were set up with this slide that I love. First, you are in a point, and at that point, you determine your strategy. I am, I am in point one, I want to go to point two. And, and with that, you decide what you are going to do. What happens when you implement? Well, suddenly, things that you thought that you were going to be able to do, you cannot do. This is the non-realized strategy. And then things that you did not expect, it, call it virus, appear. This is the emerging strategy. So you end up in a completely different position than the one that you expected. And that's basically what we teach in business schools. Okay, all the tools to do marketing, strategy, operations, finance are related to basically develop this process and implement this process. Um, um, what happens then? Okay, like we have a clue in, in, in Alice in Wonderland. When, when Alice, when Alice uh, get lost, uh, she founds uh, this card that appears and disappears uh, and she asks, okay, what, what path should I take? And the card says, where do you want to go? And the card says, uh, and Alice says, uh, I, I don't mind. And, and the cat says, then it doesn't matter. So the most basic element in a decision-making process is the target. If you don't have a clear target, you don't have criteria to determine what is a good decision or a bad decision. Or as a friend told me some years ago, Guillermo, there are two types of people in the world. The one with clear targets, the ones without them. The first ones use the second ones to achieve their targets. So do we have clear targets? There are many companies that don't have clear targets. They are just following the trend. The, the economy is going up, then they follow the trend. When the economy is going down, as they don't have a strategy, they just close and disappear. So this idea of the targets being the reference for everything, uh, or the paper from 1981 about a, a smart targets, simple, measurable, achievable, etc., basically is what Seneca said thousands of years ago. If one does not know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable. So at the end of the day, we were teaching things that everybody knew from years ago. And what happens once you have a clear target? You need to develop alternative. You, you have already was a godfather. Yeah, we discussed this before. Yeah, I have everybody focus here at this point. Best movie ever. So to achieve one target, I have many several alternatives. And that's why in some courses, I even teach creativity for decision making, because many of the problems now is, is that people don't know how to develop alternatives how to develop different ways to achieve a target. So what is the target of the family Corleone to go back to the legal business? But if you were Don Vito to achieve that, Don Vito is going to make you an offer that you cannot refuse. And then you wake up in the morning with the screen of your laptop, bleeding oil between the sheets in your bed. Yeah, I guess you know the reference. And, and then suddenly Michael takes over and is the new is the new CIO of the, of the Henko Oil Company. And, and 
Michael wants to achieve the same target. He's following the Don Vito's, uh, Don Vito's uh, lessons. But Michael says, I don't need mobsters. I need, do you remember what Michael says? What, what was Michael needing to, to achieve the target? Anybody? No? Lawyers. Lawyers are worse than mobs. Do we have any lawyer in the room? Is there any lawyer in the room? May, may I ask you to leave for a second? I'm going to talk about lawyers. No? Okay. So the point is that when. Hey, Guillermo, when... I'm a lawyer. Oh, my Lord. I need my <laughs> lawyer then to talk here. <laughs> so, so when you, once you have a clear target and, and you want to achieve it, the first thing that you need to do is to understand that to achieve your target, you are dependent on other agents that you cannot control, but you can try to influence. So your students, your, your providers, your faculty, your competitors, all of them are going to uh, help you or, or, or put a problem, give you problems to, to achieve your, your target. So you need to align that. You need to know your targets, but you need also to understand the targets of those other agents involved in the process. And if you can align your targets with their targets, it's going to be easier to do that process. Okay. For example, it's very typical uh, when I enter into a classroom and I have a, a 20, 20 sessions or 15 sessions um, course, first thing that I do to the students is, what is your target? After working with me, all these sessions, what do you want to get? And sometimes things happen. They say, hey, Guillermo, you have prepared an amazing course. Great syllabus, but you see that mostly is focused on technology, internet, innovative firms, and many of us come from pharma industry. So could you please include something related to a highly regulated industries? If I don't ask for their targets, if I don't understand, if I don't get the information, regardless the course is fantastic, their satisfaction is going to be lower. So understanding which are the targets of those shareholders, the stakeholders that we have in the process is important. What is the best way to learn how to make decisions? basically to play poker. Do you have poker players here? Is there anybody here that plays poker? Professional poker players? Nobody? A prof Semi-pro maybe? A professional poker player is a player that plays with a smoke, with whiskey. If you only play with whiskey, it's semi-pro. No, no semi-pro players either? No? Okay. I love poker, okay? I'm writing, Paul says that it's a poker club, not pro. Okay, come on. You, you are semi-pro. So, I love poker. I'm writing a book called Poker and Management. It's basically to justify my addiction. No, honey, this weekend you stay with the children. I have to go and research for the book. And yeah, and the point is, this is true. I mean, some years ago, I went to the casino in the outskirts of Madrid and I talked to Alfredo, the, the marketing manager, an amazing guy, and he led me in and I made a group year course. I have a group year diploma just in case I want to dedicate in the future to a decent thing and leave this teaching job. The point is that when I was there learning how to play poker, learning how to be a croupier, I discovered something amazing. If I watch a football match, basketball match, tennis match, I can tell you if a player is performing well or not. But when he was playing poker, I had no idea how to do that. So I asked. And uh, my wife is, is a very close friend of a famous um, female poker player here in Spain, Leo Margaret. And Leo said, Guillermo, it's very easy. A good poker player who plays well makes a lot. When playing bad, loses a little. So what do you think is the most basic learning a poker player must learn? The most important one. That defines everything. I also love Lady Gaga, absolutely. Yeah, it's very important to try to influence the other the other players, the other agents in the process more. Paul says how not to play badly. True, but what, what is the, the basis on that? I give you a clue. Fernando, yeah, you were going to say something? You were not expecting questions from me, yeah? Yeah, reading the others. Reading the others, good one, good one. You're a semi-pro also, Fernando. Nobody else? Okay, I give you a clue. Leo said, when they lose, she did not say, if. What is the most basic learning a poker player learns? It's impossible to win all the time. You are going to lose. Poker like life is a decision-making game where you have incomplete information and to achieve your targets, you depend on other agents that you cannot control, but you can influence like Fernando. So, 
when you make decisions, you must have a clear target. You get information to make those decisions, but sometimes you have too many information, intoxication, or a lack of information. And to achieve your target, you are dependent on other agents. So the first thing a decision maker must learn is that you are going to fail. It's impossible to make it right all the time because there are things that you can control and things that you cannot control. And this is the basic of a stoicism. This is the basic of, of a stoic philosophy, which is something that we also have been teaching for many, many years. And um, I, I must say that uh, I am not a fan of, of failure. I'm not a guru of failure. There's many people that say failure is fantastic. Failure is great. Embrace failure. Failure sucks. You feel really bad. You, 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 may, have, you may lose a lot of money. You may have to fire a lot of people. But failure, like Thanos, is inevitable. It's impossible to win all the time. So we need to learn how to cope with that. And Stoicism, for, for almost 3,000 years, was focused on how to do this. So probably you remember this pledge, God give me grace to accept with serenity the things that cannot be changed, courage to change the things which should be changed, and the wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. Well, uh, I'm sure that you don't think that this is coming from the ancient Greeks, and it's true. Stoicism is a philosophy that is coming every now and then. And whenever we are facing talk times, normally Stoicism arises again. So it was 3,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, there was a, again a, a resurgence after Christianity. There was a resurgence during the, the Middle Ages. So Stoicism is something that is coming regularly. Why is Stoicism so valuable, so interesting? Well, first of all, uh, as we said before, it's trying to use some tools that we all know, uh, for example, they study basically three areas, the ethics, how you behave and how to behave well. Second, the logic, so the science, the knowledge. And third, the physics. Let's, let's put it this way. Stoicism is studied how we behave, how we feel and we behave, how the environment works and our relationship with that environment. So the physics is about the environment and trying to explain what is going around us. The ethic is about ourselves and trying to understand how our brain works and how we make decisions and fulfills. And the logic is trying to link one and the other. That was basically the idea. And they develop a lot of tools based on controlling these virtues, these emotions and, and, and tools that we need to apply. The, the, the wisdom, learning, having tools, the courage, I mean, having the capability to make complicated decisions, to, to apply, to implement those decisions, justice, having a fair sense of what is correct and what is not, mostly in society, and then temperance to be able to uh, understand and to do that in this process. And, and at the end, this is coming from Plato, we have the idea of the cave, we have the idea of the perspective. It's important to get information from others. It's important to live in another cultures and to talk to them, or having conversations like this one that we're having today, because these help us get perspective because all of us made our mind with a limited amount of information and taking into account our feelings and the bag that we, the backpack that we come with after several years of education or living in a country or a family, et cetera, et cetera, which is something that is also discussed in the Godfather. Also, storytelling is very important. I mean, if I have a great, a great idea, if I have something important to say, but I don't have the way to make sure that the people understand it, then this is going to be a problem. And, and as Steve Jobs said, the most powerful uh, person in the world is a storyteller. So you can be a very good person, have a very good intention, but if you are not able to, to tell a good story, to market it, to, to be able to be understood, then you have a problem. And we all have a problem. So why we do all this? Well, philosophy is not just a way to promise uh, or secure anything or something like that. It's basically a way to build yourself and grow on your own. And when you do that, if you do that trying to, to live a good life, this is going to have a good impact into all the others. And, and this begins with our, with our legal efforts, okay? Now I have a project in my institution. Uh, I am responsible for, for something called Women in Tech. And, and the Women in Tech has been for many, many years uh, something to visualize the problem and, and uh, something to make an event and discussions and stuff like that. And what he said is, okay, that's fantastic. Uh, there is a lot of people doing that, uh, doing it very well. But the point is that I have every year hundreds of students in my master's. And when they finish, the females make less money than the male. Let's solve that problem. What do we need to do to solve that problem? 
So I don't want to discuss in general about the many factors that we know that may influence that. What I want to basically is try to solve this small problem for this type of students in, in this particular context. And if there is no solution, okay, let's see what we can learn that can be applied in other places. So sometimes it's not to try, how, how was the, the, the saying? Everybody wants to change the world, but nobody wants to change themselves, yeah? Or, or this other saying from this uh, Marine, uh, this Navy uh, Navy SEAL that, that began with, make your bed in the morning. If you want to be successful, first thing, make... so sometimes the capability, the discipline to do the small things and to do them recurrently is more powerful in the long term than, than, the, than the big ideas that sometimes never land into anything. And we're beginning to see that right now in the current world. So to understand uh, easily the situation, we need to know a little bit about the gang of three that probably you know, Plato, uh, Socrates, and Aristotle. Why? Because they, they were the foundations of our current make of decision-making and understanding the world. Uh, Plato with the cave and the idea of the perspective, we, we don't see exactly what happens. We have only part of the information. Socrates with, with his method of asking questions, trying to understand why and making a lot of questions to, to put a frame, to create a frame. And finally, Aristotle with the taxonomy. Okay, this is a chair. We have a stool and we have four, four, uh, four legs. No, yeah, but that can be a table. Okay, in a chair, you have something in the back so you can sit. So let's differentiate chair from table. And we all agree. What, one of the problems that we have right now, one of the reasons we have such polarization is because even at a language level, things that we were agreeing on, now we disagree. There is not a common point. We're beginning to change the way we use the basic words. And that was the basic for the Greeks. Let's find common places so we have areas where we can work, negotiate, understand, collaborate. If you break that, then the polarization grows. So this was the basics of everything that we do. On, on top of that, the Stoics built. And the Stoics built with adversity, facing problems, as we said before. So the same way in our schools, we create problems for our students to learn. This is what, this is what the Stoicism, what Seneca said, you learn by facing adversity. And another problem that we have today, some people ignoring reality, their alternate facts. Well, you can ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality, and not in the long term, and not for everybody, maybe a small amount of people. So Stoics were very well focused on this, and, and they were not just raw, uh, rational. They, they understood that they were emotions. Um, I give you an example. This is an article that we got published in, in MIT Sloan about uh, how to improve cybersecurity. Many companies think that what you need to do in cybersecurity is just block everything. If you block everything, you will not be hacked. What we discovered talking to several hackers is you're going to be hacked. It's a question of time and money and a little bit of luck. It's impossible not to be hacked. The same way it's impossible to win all the time. So what is the best way for companies to secure themselves? Doing three things. First, of course, put measures, but measures that are correlated with the, with the performance that you want to get from the systems. Second, create a system to detect if you are hacked because you you're going to be hacked. It's impossible to, to completely eliminate the risk. So put in place a measure to detect as soon as possible if you're having hacked. And once you detect that you're having hacked, has a policy that everybody knows on how to behave. The funny thing is that you can apply this to the pandemic. The countries that behave better put some measures, put in place a system to detect if the virus were there. And when the virus were there, they have a policy in place. Only locking everything was not working in the long term. So we, we need to think differently to solve this problem. Also, I analyzed teenagers some years ago to try to understand uh, how was possible, for example, the, 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 the theory says that teenagers, that the top entrepreneurs in the world are um, around 39, 40 years old, but there are hundreds of teenage uh, entrepreneurs that supposedly don't match with this theory. And the, the, the critical success factors to be an entrepreneur are experience, experience in the industry or, or access to financial uh, uh, financial resources. So but come on, a 14-year-old guy cannot do that. A 16-year-old guy, how do they do that? Then the theory is wrong or, or, or something we're missing. What we were missing is that uh, these, these teenagers were basically focused on new industries that were appearing. If the app stores appear and you have six months of experience, relatively, that's a lot of experience. And most of them were focused on the innovative part and not on the financial or CIO positions where you do need 
the capability to be seen and access to finance. So we unveil this information following a little bit of these principles. Those are the most well-known Stoics. Senon de Sitio, who began with everything. Then we have Marco Aurelio, Epicteto, and Seneca from Spain. Well, sorry, Rome at that moment. So they developed many of these ideas, many of these histories. And, and they said something that I normally say to my students in a different way. May the gods give you years. The rest will be up to you. Normally, when I finish my classes, I don't tell my students good luck. I say, I, I wish that you don't have bad luck. Because if you don't have bad luck, after working with you, I know that you will have a great life. Because now you control what you can control, and you have the tools to be a great person, basically, with, with what you have in your hands. And by the way, I said that data and people will save the world and solve a lot of problems. And I am the responsible for the Master in Computer Science and the School of Science and Technology. OK, look, Aristotle developed the logic. And with the logic, developed a way of making synthesis that helped them determine if something was truth or not. The Stoics elaborated on that and created a system to make sure that this worked for many, many situations. The funny thing is that this logical system created with sentences and fallacies and syllogisms was used by George Gould to develop the algebra. And his algebra, the mathematical system, was based on this logic. And George Gould inspired Claude Shannon. And Claude Shannon, who was published in philosophy journals, developed the modern information theory and the digitalization. And he's one of the fathers of the modern computer. So the reasons why nowadays we use computers and we use mobile phones and we have digitalization is because 3,000 years ago, somebody developed the logic. So there is a total and absolute link between the problems that they wanted to solve and how we use what they created nowadays. So they are still valid. They are still fashionable today. Finally, Nola Sapiens says in experience that the best way to address this is just trying and practicing and uh, incorporating this into your tool set. And that's also what we do. This is Ruth Radio. She's a colleague. She has dyslexia. And she has been all her life trying to find dyslexia. She ended up being a, a linguistic, finishing university, regardless of her dyslexia. She learned English just by going to countries and listening because he could not, she could not read properly. She developed two patents, got a lot of awards, went to Pittsburgh Carnegie Mellon. Now is at Thai University. And she has developed a tool that she gave for free for children to detect dyslexia and reduce children at uh, school dropout. So you practice solving those problems on yourself and working with others. All the tools that the Stoicism has uh, create a diary, write what you know. I mean, sometimes you see it clearly, but writing helps a lot. Writing every day a little bit about what happens in your life and how you do. Share, speak with other people. I'm happy that you're here. We, 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 when you attend something, uh, this conference like this, when you, when you share your ideas, that's fantastic. That makes you grow and helps you understand others, put you in the, in the shoes of others. Challenge yourself. Try to improve with challenges. And, and also uh, take things a little seriously. Humor is fantastic. You saw a comic before. Years ago, I was teaching economics to students that didn't want to learn economics. So I began <laughs> using jokes. And then I made a comic. And uh, well, I have some conferences. that you, you have seen some of the things that I say in these conferences. I do the same at Thai Business School. Let's enjoy life. And one another tool that is helpful a lot when you have a very bad uh, mood, a very bad situation is negative visualization. When you wake up in the morning, Try to think about the worst thing that can happen to you or this discussion you have with that person that you don't like or you or you struggle with and try to visualize. So if this happens, you are not going to feel so uncomfortable. You will be more controlled and this is not going to create you a bigger impact. So this helps also a lot. It works. And finally, when you rise in the morning, think of what a precious, precious privilege is to be alive, to breathe, to think, to enjoy, to love and think that every day. Uh, my mother passed away two weeks ago, and she, she had me when I was uh, 22 years old. And, and that's one of the things that she taught me is enjoy life, uh, be a good person, work hard. And, and if you do that, you will have a great life. And uh, in the hospital with the cancer, even the last days, she was more worried about all the people that was around, that they were happy, that they were okay, even the workers in the hospital, than herself. So when you have something that inspires you like that, uh, it's a little easier, but at the end, everything depends on us. And well, this is basically what I wanted to tell you. Hope it was valuable and very happy to open a question for them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Guillermo. Excellent. HP, are you going to speak? 
All right. So I guess is uh, Hitendra's on. Okay, Hitendra. No, go, go ahead, Ron. No, I was just going to say in in addition to I I love your kind of way to personalize and make it more enjoyable and acceptable and I'm sure the audience is more receptive and all your life lessons in there. One of the ones that we found I'd kind of like your comments on. We find that storytelling is a great way to break down barriers, whether they're real stories or made up stories, stories help you understand, help you as an instructor understand, and they definitely help the, the student connect. I wondered if you could comment on stories and how you use them or how you advise other people to use them in their cl classes. Okay, first of all, uh, you can use um, the, the, the top sellers, the, the top stories. Uh, let me tell you, let me tell you a, a real example. Um, during the pandemic, I, I was um, teaching a group of um, professors, economics professors. They were teaching, I think in America it's K-12, so they were teaching uh, students that, uh, that are 14 to 17 years old. And, and I, I was going to teach them how to use the stories. And uh, the first uh, session, the first working day, you cannot imagine what was my, my presentation about. Yeah, the Godfather. So <laughs> it, it is what it is. So yeah. after half an hour, I saw that they, they were struggling. They were not feeling comfortable. And, and I stopped everything and I asked, okay, but they feel that something is going on. And they say, Guillermo, we love your presentation. Of course, everybody loves my presentation. No. They say, we love your presentation, but remember, we teach to 14 to 17 years old students nowadays. And I say, you are right. So regardless of what I have prepared for the other sessions, let's do something. When we finish today, go to your students and ask them, what do they read? What do they listen to? What do they watch? And they, they gave me a list. So uh, I remember, do you know Attack on Titan? Attack on, T Attack on Titan? It's a manga comic. It's one of the 70 manga comics that have sold more than 100 million units. Okay, we made one class about that. Uh, the Big Bang Theory, there is even a web page, Basinganomics. So try to use those uh, stories, those uh, shows that everybody knows that they are nowadays being, being used uh, or, or loved by your audience. And let's see if you can use them as the carrier for your, for your story, for, for what you want to tell. Try to find a metaphor or a relation or a way to put it together, a comparison, for example, to, to, um, explain, uh, to explain complex problem solving. We use a lot of Dr. House, House mm -hmm. Medical Doctor. Why? Because a strategist, a good strategist, is is uh, Mr. Wolf from uh, Pulp Fiction, Tarantino. Yeah. He knows what he has to do. He's a performer. He's an old performer. I am twenty. I am twenty minutes from there. I will be there in ten. <laughs> but you you see that he has already done this. He perfectly knows how to do it. But when nobody knows what to do, when nobody knows what is the the problem, Doctor House is the only person that is operative. He's a social. He's a sociopath in any other situation, but there is the best. So complex problem solving is a little bit like that. You need a little bit crazy people. So take a look at what are those stories, and on top of that, of course, use the stories that you love. Because if you love a story, if you have the passion for that story, you're going to transmit that. So even if they don't understand or they don't like it, they will get the interest thanks to the passion. So that's my recommendation. Use yeah. the stories, stories that you love. Use stories that everybody knows. Yeah, perfect. So be selective and personalize them. I like that. Good. Hit Dr. Haro. Yeah, I've, I've got a question which um, we are increasingly struggling with. And I, I like, I mean, I'm, personally, I, my style is Stoicism. And I believe in logic. I believe in rationality. I believe in asking questions. But um, our society is changing very rapidly saying, but um, we agree to disagree. Um, that's not what my beliefs are. Um, we got different starting points. How do you get a group of people, a team of people to sit together and work using these philosophies? Do we need to first teach them the premises and say these are the rules by which how we think and act? Um, because I know I can change, but it seems very difficult for me to work with a group of people and make the whole team move in the same direction, debate, argue, disagree, 
and and and, and do that. So so that's, that's that's the first question. How do we get a group of people to embrace the philosophy of how to think and act? Now, particularly I, a diverse group, a diverse group. Yeah. Okay. I, I love your question because uh, the, it, it's a, it's very pertinent, and I remember a very nice tweet that I read some years ago. Uh, who said the most complicated thing of working in a group is to convince the other ones that they have no idea. <laughs> so, um, yeah. To give you <laughs> and, and, and Paul, I just uh, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure the, the real point is I'm not trying to make other people agree with me. I want to have a very healthy dialogue and discussion and debate versus polarization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I got that, but I, I love that tweet because it's it's very funny. Is that feeling when you are in the group that the group is not working? And I tell you more. <clears throat> you you see the uh, the eye here uh, right now. Absolutely, all of our courses, all of them without exception, they have group work. All of them, we force our students to work in groups. In absolutely all, I have I have faculty that come and say, "Yemo, yeah, I'm going to teach databases in group. You have to do it." You can do it. There is people doing that because at the end of the day, you're going to be dealing with other people one way or the other. So it's very important what you say. How do we work in a group and, and do that? Uh, first thing, I, I would try the opposite. Don't try to, to teach or to establish the basis of that philosophy. As I said before, one of the funny things that worked for me is that I, I have been using a stoic philosophy for many years without knowing that it was that I was doing it. Sometimes it's not a question of putting a name to, to that. It's more important that people understand that you need to have clear targets than to explain them that this was coming from a philosophy with a full structure and all the elements. So focus on that. Focus on the small minor changes that you can agree with all of them. Try to detect which are those common areas where you all can agree. So if, if there is a common area that, that you agree, then you have these other areas where you can disagree. Many companies do this with off-site meetings. So you get a personal relation or uh, get, getting out of the office and going for lunch in, in the Spanish culture, Latin American cultures, the, the eating process, the, the having lunch process helps create some bindings that when you go into the work part, uh, smooth a little bit. Well, also alcohol is a smoother, but we're not going to talk about that here. So there, there are some tools that can help in the process of doing that. And you need to make a plan in the long term. It's complicated to work in groups. If one of the most complicated things and, and probably uh, one of the reasons uh, why we have this, this problem is linked to what you said before. If you look at the media, we have a lot of blockbusters, a lot of top movies where we see group of talented people or group of very different people that are put together and are very operative and work incredibly well. That's super unusual. It's super complicated. So to have a group working well together takes a lot and it's not easy and and it's you need to keep working with the team on that um and it's just in the word we all the time trying to avoid the people to say most of the time i or no we're doing we're working is setting up some some specific tools and also creating some problems on purpose so the group solve them together um i give you an example it's not exactly a group thing okay but to give you an example of creating problems i have a daughter She's 15 years old now, oh my Lord. The point is that when she was very small, okay, uh, when she was in the bed, she wanted to crawl out of the bed and, and the bed was a little high. So if I allow her to go down, she is going to have a, a, a crust that is not going to be uh, healthy. It's not going to be funny. But when she's crawling out of the bed, if I grab her, this is a game. So it's a problem because every time she's going to be doing that, even if I don't see, to play the game that I, I catch her. So how to solve this problem? What I did was I put her in the sofa. Uh, I put a, I don't know how to say this in English, matrache, a colchon. I put what we have in the bed that is, um, yeah. The that's it. Yeah. So I put them in, in below the sofa. So from the sofa to the, to the new, the cushion, to the new, to the new uh, uh, surface, it was not so high. She didn't like it but it was not unhealthy. It was not a problem. She was not injured. So after a couple of times, she, she began to be more aware. And that way, with some months, I taught her how to go first with the legs. So sometimes when you're working in a group, 
you need to create a crisis on purpose so the group solve it if you do that the moment a real big crisis appears the group has the experience we can solve the crisis together we have done it before we know that there are challenges but we can do it if you never have for example a crisis in a group and everything is going well and everything is going under control when a crisis comes and it's going to come they don't have that experience and then the group may explode so try to take the lead in these things sometimes even tricking and creating those things because that helps the group improve and, and get to work together that's great um uh, we've got a question for paul uh do you want to put a turn on your microphone and Ask your question, please, Paul Farwell. Yeah, thank you. Well, first, I'm I'm jealous of wherever Hitendra you are based. It looks very beautiful there. It's so all in the mountains. <laughs> it looks, yeah, it looks spectacular. My question, Guillermo, has to do with complex problem solving. You you had a screen where you show a little bit of the of the evolution of all the different areas of thought and science that have built up, especially over the last 80 years or so. And there's a real kind of like almost linear constructivist way to approach complex problem solving and that's how we teach at least in western education you have math class and then you have algebra class and then you have calculus and you know you're building on knowledge and so there's this idea i think in education that that's how you learn and that's how you know but as there's more and more areas of knowledge and more things known then there's more things you have to study and more things you need to know before you can do complex problem solving suddenly however there are tools like chat GPT, where you just ask it something and it tells you, and you don't need to actually know all that stuff that came before. So my question to you was about this moment that we're in and how do we teach people to do complex problem solving when on the one hand, you have the idea that you need to learn all of this base knowledge before you can do complex problem solving. But on the other hand, you have these fantastic tools that allow you to put in an input and you get a response and you don't necessarily know uh, where that came from. So where, what is knowledge today in this, with this dichotomy of ways to approach knowledge? Okay, it's a great question uh, to answer it. Um, I'm going to use um, Isaac Asimov. I'm going to use um, escape rooms and I'm going to use Ronaldinho. So uh, first of all, uh, the Ronaldinho effect. Um, I don't know if you're familiarized with soccer, but uh, for, for many, many years, you could be a professional soccer player without knowing why the ball was in a sphere. Okay? If, if you had enough uh, physical capability and some tactical knowledge, there have been players, uh, for example, how is, this, how is this famous actor that appeared uh th this this actor that was a football player in Wimbledon I don't remember the name now um Paul John Paul do you remember um from which country is is British he played in the Wimbledon and he appeared in a snatch uh let me find the snatch from Guy Ritchie the snatch movie cast yeah this is Johnson, it's Johnson. I don't remember the name now. Oh my god. Um, I think it's Dennis Johnson. No. Okay, I searched for it later, and then uh, Beanie Jones. He's Beanie Jones. Beanie Jones played. Let me show you. Beanie Jones played in the Wimbledon, and you can read about him. Uh, he was the less skilled player ever, and he played a lot of seasons. Okay, basically physical capabilities, strength, and, and making uh, making all the other players to be afraid of him. This, this was his his uh, his way of playing. So, um, what happened nowadays? What happened nowadays? Another example could be Ronaldo Nazario when he went back to Real Madrid of the Galacticos. He also had a very nice belly. Yeah. Okay. Nowadays, this doesn't work. Nowadays, we have a problem. Uh, do we have people from the islands, British people here? Probably. <laughs> Probably, okay. Now, now, British players, they stop smoking, they stop drinking beer, and they stop uh, uh, eating hamburgers. So now they have nutritionists. Now they run like crazy. So nowadays, the physical condition is a commodity. 
before was a competitive advantage. So even top skilled players, if they are not at their, at their peak, they cannot compete. And this has happened in history several times. A new technology, a new innovation happens, and what was a competitive differential advantage is changing and it's not anymore. So innovation is about that. There is a nice book about, uh, about innovations from uh, Tim Harford, and he explains the before and after on how this innovation reshaped the industry. Second, um, what is the impact in different type of people? Because we're going to have people that are going to be lazy and say, yeah, fantastic, let's do this. Let's use that. I mean, Isaac Asimov uh, wrote a lot about this particular. Isaac Asimov uh, wrote about, uh, about profession, wrote about Susan Calvin and Joe Robot and what happens in a society when everybody is, everything is covered, everything is covered by robots. And, and he thought about that. And he said, well, for some people, this is going to be fantastic. I do less. But for other people, they're going to be searching for challenges. They're going to be trying to find a way to go further, to do things that have not been done, to do things that this technology cannot do for us. And that's where the escape rooms appear. Uh, why, why we love escape rooms? Why we love puzzles, riddles, doodle? Because we like to be challenged. It's in our brain. It's designed to solve problems. And, and we love it. So, of course, a lot of people is going to change the way they do these things. It happened with the Wikipedia. And it happened with the, with the printing machine. But with the printing machine and the lowering of the price of the, of the paper to do the prints and then the increasing knowledge of the people to learn how to read and stuff like that. So you need several factors. You need more than one factor. But the point is that you need that. So yeah, nowadays we have a new tool that can do amazing things. But at the end of the day, this is going to reshape some of the things and we need to think about how to implement it. For me, ChatGPT is being uh, very helpful, not in the sense of using it, is because many, many professors that I know uh, in my institution and other institutions, they ended up being lazy, sorry, efficient. <laughs> so now that ChatGPT is in place, they need to rethink how they evaluate. I, I still need to create a process that make people acquire competences, knowledge, and skills. How do I check that they have done it? If you were just asking for an essay and evaluating that essay, you don't know if the essay is from that person or from ChatGPT. So if what you want is to evaluate the output, it's fantastic. I don't mind how you do it. It's originally from you. You made the questions to ChatGPT to obtain that. That's a new tool. It's, it's the same as if you make interviews to other people and with those interviews, you write something. The point is that if I want to evaluate you cap your capability to develop some ideas originally, then I have to do something else and I must check that you have not done this. So we need to redesign some processes and evaluate in a different way. And now we have the problem of the cost because maybe that is more, co more costly. We need more people individually with, with the students, but this has happened in, in, in education before. When, when online education appeared, many people thought that you can have one, 200 students in a classroom and we discovered that it's not like that. Professor. Um, great, great question on ChatGPT, and I, I think um, that story is evolving. I think for many of us, um, we took ChatGPT and applied it to all of our methodologies on Jimmy, and we were able to get really meaningful, useful output data, which normally would take eight weeks for for consultants. So we took a methodology, and we said, okay, let's create a team AI team, which just ask questions, and and we went through it. What it came down to was very clear ask good questions was important. And then there was also look at the output and make sure that you were actually getting something meaningful on insights, and then you get to do a little bit more. But what, what I did see, and then I think this is a question maybe just to add to the question that was asked, is the average output of an average person, the, the output of an average person was quite good. And as a result, it was hard to distinguish between um, a student or a person who's worked uh, very hard on getting some meaningful outputs versus good outputs. And we're not talking about the geniuses. I think chat GPT will not substitute geniuses. The ones are on the cutting edge of science and technology and other things. But for the majority of the population, I think we've shifted their innovation quotient and the intelligence quotient quite a little bit higher that we cannot differentiate between a C student and a B student or a C level of consulting work versus a B consulting work. I think the A's will always be there. But the B's and the C's are clumping together. The, the problem is that when you when you use that grading system, a B or a C, 
you're using a grading system, focus on grading the way they were learning or performing before. Give you an example. I work in the entertainment industry. So movies. At first, the movies were blockbusters, more than $100 million. Independent movies. You can make a movie like The Mariachi for $6,000. And then you have a lot of middle-class movies that costed forty to $50 million. Suddenly, when internet appeared, everybody thought, like, like when they're when the television appeared with the radio and the and, and everything, okay? The newspapers, the radio, the, every new media, th people thought it was going to make disappear the previous one. So when internet appeared, many people thought that the movies were not going to be uh, seen as before. What happened was that this was polarized because there was so much content. The amount of content was so huge that you value more the big, expensive, top quality content and some of those independent ones that are very, very interesting. So the, the movies in the middle began to began to suffer. The middle class of content began to suffer because there was too much content to, to, to evaluate. To, so at the end, what happened? The, the value in the value chain shifted from the content creator to the, to the one that controlled the channel. So then what happened? People went to YouTube. More people went to YouTube than TikTok. So suddenly, a lot of people that were B or C content creators in the movie industry suddenly could create content that attracted the attention of a lot of people with a small cost. Uh, were they more talented or equally talented than the others? No, the system was helping them. Music, auto-tune. With the auto-tune, you have singers that 50 years ago would never have been singers, but they create a brand. They leverage on other values. So there are other strategies that can help with that. Um, I think that this is this is the challenge right now. How this industry is going to be reshaped is what is uh, fascinating and, and, and how uh, we are going to use these tools. But something similar has happened in, in those industries in this sense. They will be modified. If you have a lot of content that can be created easily by anybody, that's not going to be differential. So companies will expect from consultants something different, a brand, a, a unique methodology that you have created, like like you, you, we talk about complex problem solving, uh, and and Cinefin from Snowden is one of the references in the Spanish market. My co-author, my colleague Javier Garcia de Cuenco, is the reference. So we still have that with animation. Many people thought that actors were going to disappear. They're too expensive. They come late. Oh my lord, they're divas. Let's forget about actors. Well, we will use animation. At the end of the day, people want heroes want people that they can admire. So actors are still there and they're going to be. So if you can create a brand and you can link your brand to a framework, a methodology, something that you do that is differential, even if what you do differentially is to ask good questions to chat GPT. Isaac Asimov created a story that he developed in several short stories about multibag. Multibag was a computer uh, down in the air. Nobody could see it, but there were terminals you could address and make questions. And in fact, this is one short story that says the last question. And it's the same. Google was like that. Wikipedia was like that. Now we have ChatGPT, but the idea is more or less the same. And remember, artificial intelligence is learning uh, of what we do. So it's converging. The main problem for artificial intelligence in the long term is going to be creativity. Not creativity in the sense of what we do now. Creativity implies makes things wrong. I mean, not everything that is wrong is creative. It's not valuable. It's not an innovation. But one of the things you need to be creative is to try to test to go out of the boundaries to mix completely different things. And yeah, we can teach a machine to do that, but that to some extent. Um, if this helps to you, what I tell my students, when you feel afraid about the singularity and artificial intelligence, take a look at the videos from the RoboCup. Have you watched the RoboCup? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Every year the RoboCup is played. RoboCup. Okay. This is, uh, this is the, I think it's the last one. So here you have some videos for the RoboCup uh, in case this helps a little bit. Yeah, so Austin Villa, Big Human. So here we have the RoboCup. Okay, this is the RoboCup. So the next time you are afraid about the evolution of technology and Boston Dynamics and etc., watch Real Madrid play in Barcelona and then watch the RoboCup. <laughs> Professor, um, I've got another question, um, which I think uh, will uh, help our audience. Um, at, at our institute, the Global Innovation Management Institute, we have this philosophy of the power of and. 
which basically means that um, you there's an ambiguity, there's uncertainty, there's the there's, there's things that seem to be in opposition, and therefore we do one or the other. But in reality, they are actually you need to do both. And one 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 thing that came to mind when you were talking about the small steps, knowing what the risks are, and managing those things. What what we we say is you've got to be thinking about doing the big, bold, crazy things as well as making sure you're doing the short-term incremental things. And you got to do both. Otherwise, um, you can't go out there in the analogy of baseball. You can go out there and swing at the ball every time trying to hit a home run. And you will, might strike out three in a row, four in a row, as you said, and game over, like in the poker. Alternatively, you can try and play base hits and go to first base, second base, third base, and slowly, incrementally get to, to, to get the big result also. And, you, and what we say is you got to be able to do both. Now, here's the challenge. The real challenge is we find human beings are either polarized themselves in terms of how they were raised in loving big, bold, crazy things, the crazy guys, and there are others who like the incremental, less risky stuff. And you cannot make the people who do less risky stuff be crazy things. And you can't ask the big, crazy people to do the incremental things, and they will just kind of say, I don't buy into this concept. And the real answer is both. We have to try and do both. Um, do you agree with that thinking? It's, a, it's an and, or do you still do you feel that... Um, there is one way and only one way, which is taking short incremental steps towards big successes. Okay, as I said before, uh, small incremental steps and the discipline are, are helpful in general. This means in a particular specific context that normally is the most typical context. But sometimes you really need these bold people, these entrepreneurs that have appeared everywhere that see what nobody else seen. Um, one of the main problems in our society probably is the capability to do that. I'm, I'm working with, uh, with uh, my colleague Javier in a book about, about uh, these top people in history. Not the one knows, everybody talk about Albert Einstein, but, but at the end of the day, every generation, there are one or two persons that normally not many people know about that have developed the basis of, of many things that have made a, a critical change. Uh, they, they have and not the, the Gordian knocked to open a new possibility or to solve a problem that, that were stopping many people from doing that things. So at the end of the day, you need a combination. Nevertheless, you must play with what you have. I mean, at the end of the day, there is people that can do both or there is people that can go crazy and think crazy things, but it's not so easy to create them. So, I mean, yeah, let's create a school to, to have people behaving like Steve Jobs. It's not so easy. There is a lot of... Uh, being a natural of course you need to work on other aspects so um, i have this discussion for example with many people about career their future career and there, there are a lot of gurus that say you must follow your passion you must do what you you, 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 you like and i say yeah yeah you're totally right what i'm going to do is just to grow a skirt gods in the heights of the everest well but probably you're not going to make much money and are going to have a funny life if you do that but if it's your passion it's fantastic and then suddenly another guru comes and says, no, no, no. What you must discover is what you are good at. Determine what you are good at and then do that and you will have a happy life. My, my answer is always the same. Do whatever you want. First discover what is your passion, then discover what you are good at, and then try and determine if you want to go for a crazy life, if you want to go for what is easy and a step and a step, or if you want to mix that and on the mornings you make money to have a base and then in the afternoons you do the, the side projects and the crazy thing. And, and this is so dependent in your moment in life when you, there, there is a saying in my, I come from the Basque country, I, I learned Basque when I was young, and there is a saying that says, Gasteak balesa saarrak baleki. It means, if the young man knew, if the old man could. When you were young, when you think that your decisions have a great impact in your life, they're going to be terrible, oh, what, what I have done, this is going to be, is the end of everything. But they are not. You have a huge amount of trees of, of decisions and opportunities in front of you. When you discover that, when you settle down, you are sold that you don't have the possibility to do the crazy things. And that's part of nature. So it's not so easy to break that. And when you find somebody that can break it, it's not so easy to surround that person with people that can follow that path. But the society, we need it. So it's great that you are trying to promote that and you are trying to work with that because uh, in a society that everybody is a row a stoic and we do everything a step by a step, we would get bored for sure. That's also what Asimov said. Uh, Professor, it's been a fantastic discussion today. Um, it was delightful. It was really, really enjoyable. 
And um, I think you pushed most of everybody's thinking over here in terms of other parts of the brain that we don't often use in our discussions and all that. So I, I, I really enjoyed the conversations today. Um, I want to I want to thank you very much for being over here. We are at the end of our hour, and um, there are many who do want to drop off because um, we are scheduled for ten o'clock. So we'll we'll tell them thank you very much. What I would like to say is just just a summary. Um, what what I learned today was. Um, there, there are philosophical ways that we can approach these problems. There, there is, um, uh, it's good to ask those questions. It's to really ask them the negative part about it all as much as the positive and, 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 and really recognize that, you know, there, there are many ways to do this kind of, kind of thinking. But what, what, what I think I learned the most over here is um, this is about me. It's, a, it's about us, each one of us really thinking philosoph philosophically in terms of how we make our impact in what we want to do. Um, I want to give you the last minute in terms of any word of advice in terms of how one we can take more advantage of what you what you do. If you want to reach out to people and people want to reach out to you, if there's a contact uh, for for connecting with you, and 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 anything else. But I want to give you the last minute to to give us some last words of advice, and then we can end this conversation uh, officially. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for inviting me, and thanks for your words. And um, I am also very jealous of the places <laughs> where some of you are. Uh, I would like to travel more. So one advice would be that try to go to other places because people that live in different places live in different culture. And this is going to help you empathize and understand how people make decisions. There is a lot of uh, prejudices that we grow because of this information. Having these conversations with people from other cultures helps a lot. Um, I would recommend you to, to love every day, regardless of the situation. Try to find a way to love, uh, read jokes. They're, they're even, I have books about jokes that were told in, in the war, in the dictatorships, in, in, the, in the most complicated situations. Uh, so try to love every day and to make someone love. And, and finally, hug every day as much as you can, uh, all the people that you love, because you don't know we're not going to be there again. Um, and sometimes we forget about that. Um, my, my wife does something amazing every time we're, we're going to, to, to the bed uh, with, the, with the children. Uh, we embrace all of us and he asks, which was the best uh, thing of the day? Which, which was the worst thing of the day that we can improve? Which was the best thing of the day? Let's go to bed with the best thing of the day and with, uh, with a hug and with a kiss that, that we gave each other. So uh, that's basically my advice. It's very basic. has also been here for 2,000 years. Works a lot and make you feel better. <laughs> Professor, those are great words to take uh, take to heart, and we can take them to our individually, to our families, to our groups, our teams, and our companies. It was a fantastic speech. Thank you very much. It was an honor and a pleasure to host you at the GM Institute Think Tank. The pleasure was mine. Thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs>